but it's that flat line. So this, this uh, dashed line here labeled A is what you expect theoretically, and if, if most of the mass is concentrated at the center, and then this line B here is what you observe. Uh, and this is something that you observe in all spiral galaxies, not all galaxies, but all spiral galaxies, and all that we've observed up to now anyway. Um, so this is something that's very common, uh, and, it's, and it's very much against what theory would predict. Uh, so it turns out that this kind of behavior, uh, you, can, you can expect, like, like it perfectly fits uh, if you had a dark matter halo. So, um, so it's, like, it's basically like a spher spherically symmetric uh, halo, so just, just a spherically symmetric ball of dark matter that, uh, that extends way out beyond our, our, the radius of the luminous matter. So it goes way out, like past here, like this dark matter halo. And whereas the luminous matter is contained in kind of a plane in the galaxy, this would be spherically symmetric throughout the galaxy. And that would explain that observed curve. Jay. Yes. Is it that the dark matter is in a sphere around the galaxy and it goes all the way down to the center of the galaxy? Yes. So yep. it's not just in a shell? On the no, all the way through. Yeah, it's spherically symmetric. Wait, I'm sorry, just one, which is important because that's one of the ways that we're going to need to detect it. it has to be right, right. right. So it's evenly distributed, or yeah, exactly, symmetric. Yeah. Yeah. So how does that cause it to rotate the same way? Because <coughs> the gravity from dark matter is pulling the the matter in the galaxy out at the same rate that the mass in the center of the galaxy is pulling in, and therefore it moves in a yeah, so I mean, it gets, it, I mean, it's, it's cumbersome the actual mathematics, but the basic idea is that you have all this matter sending way out. So, um, so like, you know, between right here and right here, the amount of matter, the amount of gravity that these two feel on the scale of this whole galaxy it is, is almost no different at all. So that's why they have almost the exact same velocity, that flat curve. Okay. Whereas if, if you look at the luminous matter, you have like more than 99% of the matter pumped into that ball in the center. And so you have it yeah. really way at the center, and so you expect it to slow down. Whereas if it's evenly distributed way out, the velocity is virtually the same on that kind of scale. Okay, cool. I'm, I, I don't know if we're going to cover this later on, but why do we not see the same effect in our solar system if dark matter is universally or yeah, uniformly distributed throughout the galaxy. Uh, it's, it's just not it's not um, it's not dense enough in our solar system. So so the sun is so dominant in terms of the matter of our solar system. So so that's what's dominating the the um, orbits in our solar system. Right. And then the dark matter is evenly distributed throughout. But it's not it's not dense enough in our solar system to have an effect in that sense. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. So that that is. Um, the uh, velocity and rotation curve on that event. So, are there any other questions on that one? Yeah, uh, like just an order of magnitude, how dense as compared to the interstellar medium? Um, or the energy density of solar, solar wind or whatever other. So, okay, so my official answer is I'm not sure. I'm, really, I'm not sure at all. Um, but I think we're talking less, a lot less still. Okay, so less, less than 1%, maybe not really negligible yeah. at short lifespans. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, <coughs> talking about uh, particles, like, like the estimate right now is 100 giga electron volt particles. Uh, so, fairly dense particles, big particles, but uh, they're not very common through. But officially, I'm not sure. But, but it is also big enough that we, we, we think we can measure it, right? That we think we can have detectors that are going to see this stuff. So, it's that. It's common enough. It's a busy use of Right. The tetratron can see. Uh, the, the Tevatron uh, may be able to create it. In fact, the LHC we're looking for, I'll talk about that a little bit too. Okay, so the final, or the, not the final, but the third major line of evidence is uh, gravitational lensing. So this again is on, this is on both the galactic scale and galactic cluster scale. So, um, so, so okay, so you know uh, Newton's theory of gravity, uh, the force is you know, gravitational constant times the mass of the two bodies over the distance squared. And then you know uh, Newton's dynamics is the force is equal to the mass of the object times acceleration. And you're always taught that the inertial mass is the same as the gravitational mass of an object. So uh, I don't know if there's a marker, but like you know those two little m's in the equation, you always cancel those. Um, so that's what you do in Newton's gravity, but that's like a major massive coincidence that 
that your that your mass, inertial mass that would affect how your your your, um, your particle interacts with all the other forces and the, exactly the way you describe the gravity that those masses are the same the inertial and gravitational mass is a super big coincidence and that was um, one of the first indications to Einstein that Newton's gravity was wrong and he used this to develop general relativity and one of the results of general relativity is that massless particles will still feel the effects of, of mass so what I mean is that is that you have this gravity that, uh, that Newton predicted but it's only with these masses and then the mass actually doesn't matter but the force of gravity comes from the mass um, Einstein went and took this and, and he, he determined that actually gravity is, is basically a warping of space-time so the particle is, is the, the mass is warping space-time and the particle is following space-time and so the, the basic thing that I want you to take from this is that Einstein's gravity predicts that massless particles will also interact with gravity and so light will feel gravity so when you have um, so when you have gravitational lensing the way, the way it works is um, Okay, um, so if, uh, if, you're, if this is a one star way out, and way far away, and this is a super big galaxy cluster, um, and then you're the observer right here, what you have is light coming in all directions, right, and a spherical shell coming out from here. So you're basically going to have it coming out, and then because of this gravity it's going to feel it, it's going to turn it, it's going to bend it, it's going it's to try and bring it in. It's not going to be enough to bring it in, but it's going to turn it. So you're going to feel it come into you here at the observer. But the way our brains are, are interacting, we always assume everything is a straight line away. So we see that light coming, and we take it, and we, we draw it on its tangent, and take it straight line, and we end up seeing it out here. But another ray of light, say, is coming this way, and it's feeling it, and then it gets bent by that gravity, and it comes, and we see it as an observer on Earth here again. So we, you know, our brains, we take it, and then what we do is we draw that line, and we draw, we see that star out here. So what we actually see is the exact same star in two spots. And in the, in the ideal situation, what happens is that if you can imagine rotating this all the way around here, you see a ring. So this is one of the best, um, this is one of the best examples of gravitational lensing, is an Einstein ring. And you can see these actual rings here. These are examples where it's actually observed these rings around galaxy clusters. So you can take, you know, you can take, okay, so, so using the, that Doppler idea again, you can calculate the distance from the observer here to this light, to that light at the center, and then you can calculate the distance to this light way out here. And then you can estimate the mass based on the amount of light and the brightness, and then you can predict you know, how much bending of light is going to occur over these distances. And then you can see what the actual bending is based on the, the ring, and again, it doesn't match. What you see is that you actually need a lot more gravity in order for that light to bend the way, it, the way it is. So again, this is another huge indication that there's, there's more matter in, the, in those central clusters that we can't see. Um, so, okay. So I, I know you explained this earlier, but can you explain again how you measure the amount of visible matter in a galaxy cluster or something like that? Yeah, so, so the basic idea is um, we have our sun and we measure how much light comes from that, what's the luminosity of the brightness from our sun. And then we can also measure the mass of our sun. Right. So then we can say, okay, this much light corresponds to this much mass. So this much brightness, this luminosity. And then we go and we see from the galaxy cluster, we see, say, a billion times, okay, so a galaxy cluster, we see a trillion times more light coming from this cluster. So we say, okay, that's approximately a trillion times more mass as the sun. It just corresponds to a trillion stars in there in that galaxy cluster. So it's, all, it's a little bit more complicated than that because a heavier star will emit more light, but that's the basic idea is that kind of scale. Well, what about all